us in prayer, and then I'll turn it over to Rusty. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity, God, that you've given us to grow, um, Father, as, as servants and as leaders. Father, I pray, I pray, I pray, I ask the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and in our lives as Rusty invests uh, his time in our lives to really disciple us in this way, Lord Jesus. I pray that uh, at the end of the day, you'd be glorified in the way that we serve and lead uh, our families and in this church body. Lord, I pray for Rusty. I pray you bless him, anoint him in his teaching, give him discernment of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Father, that uh, you might speak to us through him and through your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Rusty. Thank you. Jamo, I'm going to be on the platform today. I don't particularly like that, but that's kind of the arrangement that we have. So, although I'm looking down upon you, I'm not looking down upon you. <laughs> and I'm not talking down to you. Uh, I guess the main thing that you probably need to know about me in this context is that my name is Rusty, and I'm a recovering leader. <laughs> I, and I mean that in all seriousness. Uh, having uh, an outgoing personality, have ne having that type of personality that never meets a stranger, being somewhat forward in uh, my, my activities and enjoyment of life. I'm a sanguine type personality. Uh, from the get-go, I was a terror to my mother, and uh, I was a pain in the neck to my siblings, but everybody thought that I was going to be a leader because I had those characteristics. So it was placed in my head a long time ago that the only place that you need to be was in the lead. And I ingrained that in my life. And so I excelled in different things, uh, you know, the whole high school scene. Believe it or not, all 165 pounds of me in high school excelled in football. Uh, get this, as a lineman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was small, rural Georgia football. <laughs> but it was football. And then uh, excelled through high school, did some things there, got into college, did some things there, got out of college. God actually impacted my life significantly. I had the blessing of being raised by two wonderful Christian parents. <coughs> And in a small town, and I'll give you a little, little taste of it, in my hometown, we had 2,000 in the city limits, 2,000 people, 5,000 people in the county. Your subdivision has more people <laughs> than, than my hometown. Uh, but I called it Mayberry RFD because that's kind of what it was. Small town, USA, just awesome childhood in church all the time came to know Christ at an early age but as most teenagers do just kind of started fading away and as I went into that beautiful theological institution called the University of Georgia <laughs> I began sliding <laughs> down the road because of the influences in my life but it was it was actually there uh, that, that a group called Campus Crusade for Christ came along and they began sharing some things with me and God impacted my life in a very significant way uh, and I, I just believe that God had called me to ministry so that changed dramatically as you can imagine the trajectory of my personal life which basically led me uh, to my father's chagrin I believe away from the family insurance business uh, and, and, and to seminary, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Enjoyed my four years out there. Uh, single guy, had no place to 
go when I graduated, so I went back home and was the youth director. Uh, of course, I had a Georgia Peach back home too, and uh, we got engaged, and then I was called to a church in Woodstock. A church in Woodstock that is, it wasn't a new start, but it was a, a start that, that had some difficulties and being wet behind the ears and green and ready to go, I jumped on that opportunity to be a pastor of a church. So me and my new bride moved to Woodstock and I became the pastor of Stonecrest Baptist Church, three miles outside of downtown Woodstock. And two years after I got there, Johnny Hunt showed up at First Baptist Woodstock. <laughs> So I would enjoy watching the cars go by <laughs> every Sunday morning, the thousands of people that will just hit right into town. And uh, I can tell you some stories, and maybe in our times together, I can, I can tell you how a church cannot be jealous of another church where actually revival was taking place. I mean, that was a genuine God thing. There wasn't anything about it. You can't reproduce what happened at, at First Baptist Woodstock. It's just not going to happen. And that's why, by the way, all these new churches that get started and they start with five people and in a year they got 5,000, I'm here to tell you that is an absolute anomaly. Amen. It doesn't happen every day. And if your business or your ministry or your church is not experiencing that, that doesn't mean that you're missing the blessing of God. Absolutely. It means that God has another plan for you and for your people, and you just need to remain faithful. Now, maybe there are some things that can be done differently. There always is. But it doesn't mean that Ichabod is written over your door. <laughs> the glory is not the part. So, all that to say, Stayed there five years, learned a lot of lessons <laughs> about being a pastor of a small church. And then another church that was just getting started in coming called me. And I thought, okay, let's go there. So we started up, and this church actually experienced some tremendous growth initially. We grew from a, a group of about 20 or so. Uh, over the course, of, we, we eventually got up to about 500. Had a great ministry going there. Had staff members. And through uh, just some absolute terrible uh, leading on my part, uh, ran into a conflict with staff and with key personnel in the church. I'm just being honest with you. And uh, I won't go into detail about that, but needless to say, it's an interesting prayer experience. When you're on your knees in your study and you pray to God, God, there's some really important and powerful people in this church who don't want me here. And if you don't sustain me. I'm not going to be here. And in that moment, to sense the presence of the Lord and to hear that still small voice say, I'm not sustaining you. Wow. They don't write that in books. <laughs> that, that, that's not the answer that, that the books get written about. It's Yes, I'm going to raise up an army of <laughs> angels to come and fly over the sanctuary. Rid. I'm not sustaining you. And so we stuck around for another year. It was a death year. First time in my life, I think, I ever really learned how to die. Uh, a lot of ego death. Just dream death. You ever had any of that? Yeah. Uh, 
And it was it was all God. To God be the glory. Amen. And I had often said, I said, it'll, it'll take a stick of dynamite to get me out of this church. How about a case of dynamite? <laughs> <laughs> and things just blew up. <laughs> I'm glad to tell you right now that the church is very healthy and they've continued to move on. They had some rough patches after and we can talk about the aftermath of all that stuff. And uh, I, I am not innocent in what precipitated those, those, those events. But neither am I alone <laughs> in what precipitated those events. All that said, I learned so much about my past and the fact that when it came to leading people, I had been reading some material that just didn't line up with the scriptures. And actually, I'd been following some role models that evidenced leading of people that in retrospect, I really couldn't find validity for in the scriptures. And so it just turned, turned my world upside down. But here's the beauty of it. The beauty of it is that in 2000, I left uh, North Lanier at, in 2002. And the beauty of this is that I began being an adjunct professor at Luther Rice in 2000. <clears throat> so I was coming down here and teaching evening classes for the school. And then in 2002, the president took me to lunch. And this was maybe, well, we were four months into our severance package. And Dr. Fanagan took me to lunch and said, look, we need a professor of pastoral ministries, which you consider being full time. So that's when I started. We've been there ever since, and God's continued to provide through the school and grow. Now get this. In 1982, I got a D in, and I thought, great. Can I get an amen? amen. School amen. is over. <laughs> School is over. And God, God bless God. <laughs> He's just so wonderfully unpredictable. But always, you can always count on Him to love you. But you can never count on Him how He's going to love you. So I'm cruising along, and I'm, I'm 49 years old, and the word goes out. Guess what? The school is going to apply for SACS accreditation. Yay! It's going to be wonderful. All professors have to have an academic terminal degree from a regionally accredited school. I had a doctor of ministry degree. Now, that's, that's a great degree. I don't down, I, you know, I have one. I've been through that process. But it's not an academic degree. It's not a terminal degree. It's a PhD that I need. I'm 49 years old. PhD? You're kidding me. How am I going to learn French and German and all those core languages that you have to have for a theological degree and then spend four years getting a PhD. I thought, well, this is it. Home Depot, here I come. <laughs> but then it, it happened that the guy who was leading the Master of Arts and Leadership program had a PhD from Regent and he was leaving the school. So I went to Dr. Flanagan and I said, Dr. Flanagan, do you think I could be the guy to head up the program because this guy's leaving? And he said, yeah. I said, great, I'm going to enroll in the PhD program at Regent. Now, the beautiful thing about a leadership PhD is you get to study leadership in the original language of leadership. Do you know the original language of leadership? 
English. <laughs> no French, no German, no Latin, no Greek, no Hebrew. It's all English. I can do that. Go to school. I'm still concerned about it, though, so I'm talking to my, my, my father-in-law, and my father-in-law, I'm sitting at the table. I can see it like it was yesterday. And I look at him, and I go, Oh, man. Do I really want to go through a PhD? That scares me to death. And he said, well, how long's the program? I said, well, it's, it's if I if I put everything together, I can finish in three years minimum. He said, well, how old will you be <laughs> in three years? Mm -hmm. Of course, being a good graduate of the University of Georgia, I mean, okay, forty-nine, <laughs> 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 two, carry that three. <laughs> I said, well, I guess I'll be 49, 50, 51, 52, right? And then he gave me a piece of advice that I had never forgotten, nor will I forget. And you remember it as well. He said, well, son, it appears to me, the Lord willing, you're going to turn 52 with or without a Ph.D. Mm. <laughs> in other words get off your rear end and go get a PhD <laughs> and that's what I did so I went there great program walked in and learned that the leadership material that I've been reading was it was exceeded by the fact that leadership is a science. It's a study of human relationships and interrelationships. It doesn't just have to be the latest book on this is how I led and this is how I do it. It doesn't have to be an anecdotal experience. Don't you love that word anecdotal? Do you know what it means? It was, it was years before I knew what it meant. I, I used it all. An anecdote is one data point. Okay, so what it is is it's oh I saw that one time, and now that's going to be my 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 lesson for you. You got it. So it's a non-anecdotal science, and and, and I, I I just I was so up to here with leadership. It was just like God to put me in a study program that I hated, <laughs> and then to get there and have it revealed as. You know what? There's more to this than just the latest, greatest, oh, this is what we do now because it's hip and it's cool and it's keen. No, there's some actual science and thought and rational approaches to this. And it deals with human beings the way human beings are. So that's my story to where I am today. I am a continual learner. Uh, you know, I'm no expert, and I, I don't really want to be one. I heard a definition of an expert. You've heard this, Pastor, and that is that an expert, the word X is a has-been, and a spurt is a, a drip of water under pressure. So uh, I don't want to be that person. I just want to be a fellow learner. And then as I was studying in my, in my studies, I came across a passage of scripture that revolutionized my life. And I want to share it with you this morning. And it's found in John chapter 6, verse Here's, here's a question for you. Why did Jesus come to earth? What was his purpose on the planet? You think about it for just a minute. What do most people say is, is Jesus' purpose on the planet? Just come to save us. Came to save us. That's right. To be the Savior of the world. Any other responses? To destroy the 
destroy the works of the devil. To destroy the works of the devil. Okay, mm -hmm. what else? E any other things? Mm -hmm. Huh? To reveal to us the Father. To reveal the Father. Exactly. What? E anything else? I mean, are we covering all of the best ones? And to save that which was lost. To seek and to save that which was lost. Exactly. All of the above are correct. But that's not the that's not that wasn't what was behind. That's what he did. What was behind what he did? What was his motivation for what Jesus did and all those things? Mm -hmm. What's the motivation behind Jesus when he's seeking and saving the lost? What's the motivation behind Jesus when he's saving the world? What's the motivation for him being on the planet and dealing with these crazy disciples? He tells us in this one passage. I'm reading along, and I know you've had this happen. I'm reading the Bible, minding my own business. <laughs> And something comes up from the Scripture and says, boom, boom, slaps you in the face. You get those moments, those aha moments. And this was an aha moment for me when it came to understanding leadership, especially with regard to the person of Jesus. Because he said to his disciples, you can read the context, but in 38 he says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. And I realized something. And it's changed my life for the last 15 years. And that is that Jesus did not, His motivation was not to lead. His motivation was to follow. It was to follow the will of the Father. And nobody has ever shared with me that it, we, we always hear that Jesus is the perfect leader, right? And by the way, He is. And people write books about the leadership of Jesus. Lead like Jesus. Do this like Jesus because He's our exemplar. And that's fine. But that's not what Jesus said He came to do. He, he said, I came to do one thing. And that is, to do the will of Him who sent me. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody's sending me, I'm responding to what, I'm, I'm responding and following to, to what somebody else said. So from that point forward, as I started maturing this idea, Jesus became to me not just the perfect leader, but more importantly, motivationally, the perfect follower. And when you read, and this is what I want you to do over the course of our time together, as you're reading the Scriptures, what I want you to do is I want you to look at the life of Jesus and when you read His life and when you see His actions, I want you to understand that everything Jesus did on the planet, everything, was because He was a follower of the will of God. Now, as they say in the trade, that'll preach. <laughs> because you can get up in any class or any group of people that you serve and serve with in this church and say, what is your one desire in life? And you'll have multiple, lots of responses, but it'll usually center within this context of believers. It'll be, usually center on what? What's your one desire? Lead. To what? Lead. Perhaps. What else? Mine's to be transformed into his image. Transformed into his image. Okay, that works for me. What else? To follow Jesus. To follow Jesus. Right. Okay. So, <clears throat> I don't think anybody would have a problem with anybody saying, our ultimate goal in life is to do the will of the Father. 
And the way we do the will of the Father is because of His perfect Son. Because if we're doing the commands of His perfect Son, we know that we're in line with the perfect will of God. Right? So our whole purpose in life is to move our lives underneath the perfect will of Christ because then we will be in line with His will, which is the will of the Father. Does that make sense? So in other words, there's a straight line that's drawn through from God the Father and His will through the person of Jesus Christ to us who are the born again new creations of what it means to be a follower. So I'm not anti-leader. I'm, I'm, I'm just follower emphasized. Okay? Now, any questions? This is not a monologue. <laughs> John, Rusty, I think what I find so often is, uh, what I find so often is, uh, and myself included in this statement, is that uh, oftentimes, much of the time, we do things out of self-fulfillment or what, what fulfills us rather than seeking what His will is. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And we're going to get to that in just okay. a second. Anything else? This, by the way, I'm going to ask this a lot because I'm a teacher. And because I'm a teacher, I have to have feedback. And I'm not going to give you a test. Uh, so I have to have your feedback. Does this make sense? Yes. Is it, is it, is it something that you've thought of before? Or is it something kind of new in your thinking? To think of yourself as, in this way. For me, I've realized that, that, that he, he basically says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And when he was at the the well with the woman, he, he was telling him, my meat is to always do the will of the Father. That's it. And so that's, you know, if you follow Jesus and you're following his will, you're following in Father's will. What's interesting about that, however, and that's a very good point, is that when we talk about following Jesus, many times we talk about it from a discipleship and devotional perspective. I have decided to follow mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah. What I want to move us into and what we will move into over the course of the next several sessions is to understand the organizational significance of being a follower. And it is vitally important for those that are in leadership positions. If you're in a leader position within the body of Christ especially, it has to begin from a philosophical understanding that everybody is a follower. And that's to you. So, with that said, you have a sheet of paper in front of you. If everybody, you know, hopefully you do, and you have a beautiful lime green post-it note on that sheet of paper. I would like for you to do something for me before you leave today. And that is, I would like for you to write on that lime green beautiful post-it note one, two, maybe three questions that you would ask me or that you would want anyone to answer regarding how to better do your role here at the church. Okay? Because what I want to do with our sessions together is I, I don't want to come up here as I, as I told uh, J-Mo here. That's new to me, J-Mo. <laughs> uh, um, but as I told him, I said, I don't have anything in a can. 
I mean, I don't have, uh, we're not going to open up, I'm not going to sell you the workbook that we'll go through and fill in the blanks with. I, I, I don't have any of that. I, I don't want to have that. Because what I want to do in our time together is I want to personalize and specialize our times together and the information that we can share with one another to meet your current and future need as a leader within the body of Christ. So if you'll do that for me, I would greatly appreciate it. So that's one assignment. I have so now take your sheet of paper, take your we're about to take some notes. And what I want you to do is consider this. Draw a line down the center of your paper. And then at the top, a little T. You make a little T out of it. Very good. The, the idea of a follower first philosophy, I believe, is a biblical idea. And it, it's one that I will ask you to question. Because the last thing in the world I want to do is teach anything that is not consistent with the scriptures. I mean, it, it, I was scared last night, literally, when I was praying for our time together this morning. Thank God. This always, this always scares me. <laughs> because I want it to be right, okay? And I don't want to do damage. I want to do blessing. But, what we're going to be talking about over the next several sessions is, is not talked about uh, in a lot of leader seminars. But this is where I see it. If Jesus said in John 6.38 that He came to do the will of the Father, then something must be in that. So I, let's, we go back to Genesis and we can take a look at this, but you can look at it more specifically later. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to uh, to do this. <clears throat> That's the thing about these markers. They so on this side of the ledger is creation. And in creation, what you have is you have Adam and Eve on the scene. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it was perfect. And He creates human beings in there. And it is perfect for them. Just think about it. And one of the things that is sometimes overlooked is that within the Garden of Eden, for those human beings, they had a role to play. Their role was to tend the garden and to reproduce. That was it. So when everyone, someone is given a role, you also add responsibility. Have you ever been uh, under the quote unquote leading of a person who had a role but took no responsibility? Mm -hmm. How delightful is that? Uh, and they weren't held responsible either. So there's no accountability. But in this beautiful scenario of perfection in the garden, you have Adam and Eve operating within their role and their responsibility. And what I like to say, think is that in this world, I'm going to call it World One, okay? There is an umbrella over all of this that is unspoken, and it's submission. 
it is it is a beautiful everything is submitted to the Father everything the animals the, the, the trees the, the grass the humans everything is submitted to the Father and it's absolute perfection and Adam and Eve were created in this with a role, but they also had a responsibility. And God gave them an opportunity to fulfill His commands when He said, you can have anything in this beautiful world of perfection except one thing. What is that? It's the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, correct? That's all you have to do. Just don't do this one thing. Adam and Eve were perfectly content to obey God's will. That was their desire. And as, as obedient followers of God's will, I would submit to you that Adam and Eve were in their being followers. Every human being, I'll give you my human philosophy, every human being is created To be a follower. It, it's what, well, let me just say this. It's who we are, and it's what you do. Because what, what happens when you do what you were made to do, be made to do, what you were created to do? is that gives you fulfillment. And fulfillment is different from success. There are lots of people who are getting, doing successful things, but they're never fulfilled. When, when I consider myself as a follower, a created follower, then what happens is when I follow, I'm fulfilled. Now, you, you're already extrapolating probably into your own life because in my personal experience, I'm an extremely inconsistent follower. But the times that I really do follow and obey God's commands, what does that feel like? You know, we sing all the time about honoring God and glorifying God. Well, how do we do that? We only can we can only do that when we what? Follow. Jesus says, if you're gonna show how much you love me, then this is how you do it. You obey my commands. Well, for Adam and Eve, listen to this. I thought about this the other day and I shared it with somebody and they looked at me like you gotta be crazy. <laughs> For Adam and Eve to obey God was just like that. It was the force of gravity to them. It was what happens every time. There was no question. It's what they do. It's what they live for. I want to obey God. And so I, I said this to someone just the other day. I said, has it ever occurred to you that there was absolutely no humility in the Garden of Eden? And why is that? Da, da, da. No ego. Because there's no ego in there. <laughs> there's no pride. There's no ego to walk around and go, ooh, I'm looking good today. You know, it's it's not, hey, 
let's uh let's go do that this this, this. oh no that's against god that was none of that it was all we're going to do what god wants us to do and hallelujah let's do it it wasn't no oh, man do i have to do that now does god require me to obey his commands to show i love him what kind of love is that you see when you put it in first world language when jesus says obey my commands he's just saying because that what that that's what's good for you you know does it boost jesus's ego for us to love him no <laughs> we can't add anything to god our praises don't add anything to God. They just give us that outlet to honor Him and to love Him. And, and, and it gives us that outlet to obey Him because He says, I want you to sing forth my praise. Kind of cool, isn't it? When you think about that being the drop, uh, that's what I do. Why do you do that? It's just what I do. It's what I'm made for. It's what I'm made to do. It's what gets me up in the morning. Pretty amazing, huh? It's a little different from today. From the world we currently live. You know why? It's because there's a line in the middle of the page. And we all know that that's where Adam and Eve, should we say, crossed the line. It's actually where they think about this. We say, well, they disobeyed God. No, they quit following the commands of God. Didn't they? Mm -hmm. They quit following the commands of God. You see, a tempter came along and said, look, you are perfect creations. And God's given you all this great stuff. But the one thing he doesn't want you to have is to be in charge. When the, temp the, the temptation was to, he knows that when you eat of it, you shall be as God. By the way, when you're God, you're in charge. And that's the one thing that was revealed to our first parents is that, hey, you're no longer in charge. Well, guess what Adam and Eve did? I won't be in charge. Don't hear too many people talking about that in that terminology, but essentially that's what it was. I want to be in charge. So we have in this section here, we have what we call the fall. And in the fall... There's a new atmosphere. By the way, there is no more atmosphere of submission. Joyous submission. You see, in, in today's economy, submission is a word that you don't use very much because it just seems like oppression and, and overseeing. And all those other biblical words that we just kind of shy away from. Why? Because it's not first world. It's, it's first world language. It's not... I'm going to call this world two. It's not world two language. Because the, the atmosphere now, in that instant, became this. Control. <laughs> and this, this, this became, becomes extremely familiar territory to us because we deal with it personally and struggle with it and we deal with it in the lives of other people and, it, and by the way the beautiful thing about it is to recognize everybody deals with it so right now in world two thanks to our parents wanting to be in control by the way, the, the, the beautiful thing about being in control is, and there's a, a, a chapter in the book, it's called, Who Gets to Tell Who What to Do? <laughs> 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 I 
Well, that's, that's the big question. You know, the old joke about the little, who are you? Or we go, who died and made you God over there? <laughs> You're not mine. You, 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 where does that come from? That's not first world language. That's second world response. Because no longer do we see ourselves as having a role. What we want is we want a position. See, what, what I want is a name badge that has some special words under it. Maybe my word is president. Maybe my word is, is, is pastor. Maybe my word is... You know, by the way, you, you know there are some people out there who require these designations to be placed in front of their names mm -hmm. or you are doing them like, Bob, mm -hmm. what are you doing? You're disrespecting me. Mm -hmm. that, that assumes that you deserve respect. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't known you long enough to really determine whether that's true or not. Mm -hmm. But, you see, the position thing. And by the way, have you ever been under a person who has a position but has no business being in that position? So many churches especially have been ruined and become ineffective because they operate in a world two environment where it's... It, and, by the way, it's extremely understandable why churches fall into this. You know why? It's because the people who, who make up the church beyond the full-time staff, they've got jobs. And they are saturated day by day by day in World Two, So it, it's perfectly normal, not good, but perfectly normal for a person who is immersed in World Two to think like World Two. And guess who makes up our, our leader teams, our deacon boards, our elder groups, our our choirs, our praise choruses, our bands, all those things, these are people who have jobs. <laughs> and by the way, I really appreciate you taking the time today to spend it with me just to allow me to share this. It's, it's something that has to be reinforced and that's why I am so delighted <clears throat> that beyond the staff, we have members of the church who are here giving of their time to participate in this. Why? Because a new understanding has to be given birth in the thinking of everybody. Okay? And you guys are being, by the way, you're now being held responsible <laughs> for this information. So, I'll just say sickle. <laughs> but as Paul says, with gentleness. 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 Right? So, position is a big thing. Here's another big thing. I've got the power. Right? Power. Don't date yourself. <laughs> Until I do my moonwalk. <laughs> Michael got nothing on me. <laughs> hey, power. Why is it so many people are after money? I'll tell you why. It's because they believe that's where they can get 
Pow. Pow. By the way, I'm going to say something right now. I didn't plan on saying, but it just came to me, so it's always dangerous. Okay. And this may or may not be true. But could it be that Christians who are seeking something mystical and magical in their lives and are always looking for the new thing want to get some kind of power for themselves and power with God. You know, that sounds really cool. But it could, be, could, could it just be a matter of us not being satisfied and wanting power for God to empower me so that I don't feel like an also ran? Or is it God empowering me? You know, the thing I love, the thing I love about the Holy Spirit empowering believers is that the Holy Spirit never empowers me for my sake. It's always for God's sake. So, you see, it's all about being enabled by the Holy Spirit to do what? To follow the will of God. And by the way, with this concept, I think it would be an awesome thing if Baptist churches, when they're electing deacons and elders, would give these people an opportunity to really show that they can apply the power of the Holy Spirit in their life and serve others as the deacons should, the servants, correct? By being church custodians for a month. Give them all a toilet brush and a bottle of squeeze Clorox and say, God bless you. <laughs> Here's your new position in the church. <laughs> it's all the way down there. Because by the way, that's where the greatest of these are in the church. Not up here. Because in first world thinking, they're down here. In second world thinking, they're up here with a name tag. I, I know, I've gone to meddling. And I'm sorry. I'm really not sorry. But, all right. So, let's get to the pastor's point. We have power. These are the result of, somebody said it earlier, of our egos. So, in, in world one, we obey God's will. In world two, we're still obeying. But this is the point. Pastor, we're obeying, but we obey self. That's our struggle. Am I obeying God or am I obeying self? If I'm obeying self and I have to really check my motivation, then I'm in world two, operating within that schema. Now, in world one, I'm a follower. In world two, I'm a... This is surprising. A follower. You know why? It's because we were created to be followers. The difference between world two people followers and world one followers is that world two followers have yet to know Jesus. We're going to get to that. And world one followers follow in fulfillment because they're not trying to fulfill themselves. They're fulfilling the commands of God. It's all other-centered. It's not based on my vision for my life. I had a friend of mine one time who went to one of these uh, sessions where they were recruiting people to sell products, you know, and things like that. And if you've ever been to one of those, they'll, they'll go around the room and say, so what's the vision for your life? What's, what do you really want in life? What do you really want? What, what do you want? And everybody, oh, I want a yacht. 
I, I want to buy an island out over here. I want an automobile as long as Long Island. Uh, and my friend came around and he just stuck a fork in the whole thing. He said, you know what I really long for? I really long to obey the will of God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. We're not talking about that. We're, what do you really want? So it's all predicated on the world, too. Well, you... What you really want is what you're really following. And everybody's created to be a follower and to follow. But the only way to be fulfilled as a creature created by the Creator is to follow Him. Yes, sir. Do you, do you think that's what Paul is struggling with in Romans 7? You know, that's a very good point. And, and if you'll allow me, I'm not going to say anything about that. But that's a very good point because what I want to do is I want to look at that. But we'll come back next time and we'll pick that up. But, but here we are in World 2. We're, we're closing in on it, folks. Everybody's a follower. Are you with me? You see, see how important that is? It's just who you follow. Who are you following? In, in fact, when I'm talking to a young person or a person that's looking for a job and whatnot, they say, well, you know, I'm going in for this interview. What, what should I ask? I said, well, you, you don't really want to ask me that question. I said, but, because this is what I tell you to ask. I, I'd look at my perspective and for and I say, I just have one question. Who or what do you follow? Because if they follow the almighty dollar, then they're going to treat you as an ends to a means. A means to an end, excuse me. You are just going to become the cog in their wheel until you run out or rust out or rub out. And then they're going to replace you with somebody else because they are following the dollar. And if you can't get them a dollar, you're not going to be here. And if they say, well, I'm following, I try to follow the commands of Christ, then at least you have a glimmer of hope in world two that there's a person there who says, I see your value as a human being. You see, world two thinking devalues human beings into things and mechanisms to get them what they want in obeying self. It's only in world one that we can see human beings valuing one another for who they are as valuable creations of God. With all our faults, all our flaws. Okay? Can I, can I interject one? Interject. That, to. that that's often, and I've been under it, and where in the church, one of the ways we were so defiled is through what I call the modern church growth movement. Mm -hmm. And so, if our aim and goal in the church is to grow, not that growth is is a bad thing, but if our aim and goal is growing then we'll see others in the church, whether it's staff or members, as just a means to that end. And the same thing happens in that, in that sense as well. There's no question about it, and I want you to know, my hand's up, I was that guy. Yeah. And that was part of the situation. Okay? I was the guy who was, who was the mechanistic perspective. Because I was under the false assumption that as the senior pastor of this church, it was my responsibility to grow the church. And it was reinforced by all of our leader bodies. And it was reinforced by the financial committee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, the more numbers you got, God must be blessed. Well, that's just a vicious master. Amen. By the way, church grew in Acts as a result of what? 
the power of the Holy Spirit and persecution. That's how it spread. Jesus said, I will build my church. So maybe our information needs to be more on church building than it does on church growing. Uh, because i got news for you. If you have a church that welcomes sinners, warts and all, because we are them, we just forgive them. If you have a, if your church becomes a place of forgiveness, not condoning, but forgiveness, if your church is that place where you can meet people's needs, not all of their physical needs, there's not an organization on the planet that can do that, but at least meet the needs where this body is equipped to meet those needs. The church still grow. I don't care how bad the preaching is. Amen. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. How bad the preaching? <laughs> I'm serious. I've been in growing churches, and probably you have as well, where the pastor, he couldn't shuck the corn. He was, he was, you know, skin and squash. I mean, it was awful. But yet the church grew. Why? It's because the pastor doesn't grow the church. The people grow the church. They are the people with the re relationships that reach out and bond the people within the body of Christ. Pastors are necessary. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, we, we have to understand where the church truly grows. And it, it, it grows through you guys. You know what I'm saying? You've heard this, I've heard it. It rises and falls on leadership. Look, Here's, here's the thing. That's wrong. Here's, here's, <laughs> look, that's the next time we get together. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Man, that's the most famous saying in leadership. But can I tell you? It's really correct. But here's the problem with that. I believe in leadership. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the next time we get together. You see what you <laughs> Here's the thing. In order for that statement to be true, and I believe it is, you have to understand leadership. Most people, when they hear leadership, they believe that leadership is something that leaders do. Okay? Leaders do leadership. Well, I would submit to you that that is an improper understanding of the term leadership. Because leadership is a process. By the way, now, this is free. This, is, this wasn't part of today. <laughs> but because le leadership requires here's my responsibility. I'm the leader. What am I doing? Juggling. I'm just sitting around doing something with this thing. Nobody would call that leadership, would they? I hope not. Because leadership requires a person in the role of leader and a person in the role of follower. By the way, you got any followers? The world's filled with. By the way, there's a ton more followers in your church, and they're all leaders. So what I want us to do is I want us to tap into those followers because they're of vital importance. Let me show you something. You want to play, play catch? Sure. You mind if I throw this to you underhanded? Yes, please. Will you catch it? Uh, probably. Excellent. There. Now, you see what Matt just did? Matt paid me the greatest compliment that any person can ever pay you as a leader. What did he do? He received what I gave to him. Many times what we do with our volunteers is 
we expect just because we've got the title and we've got the responsibility that they are going to do what we say. Oh, I'm sorry. But that's the truth. It's because we've gotten in second world, world two ideas that when you're the leader, all the followers do what the leader says. Is that true? <laughs> no, it's not true. Your children don't even do that. <laughs> you know? So, here we are. Now, I'll show you. Master now the leader. Let's play catch. Okay. We'll throw it to you. Will you catch it? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Matt thinks that he's a leader. But did you see that throw? My goodness, man. You need some improvement. No work. Hey, Rickinson has a course down here. <laughs> now, you say, well, you told him you'd catch it. I lied. I know in the church you've never had anybody tell you they don't do something and then not do it. <laughs> We're going to have a meeting over here. Everybody going to be there? We'll be there. Crickets. Meeting comes home. Are you with me? I mean, I, that's, that's kind of the reality of the moment. So everything in, does revolve on leadership, but leadership is a process between the person in the role of leader and the person in the role of follower. And if those two people don't get together and operate together toward a, toward a, a common goal, then nothing gets done. Now, see, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to get us out of here at 11.15. Believe me? <laughs> Do I believe me? All right, so, look. In World 2, position is everything. Power is my desire, my one desire. Obeying self is how I get there. And being a follower of myself and my lusts and everything. By the way, interesting how what follower language comes into play when you start reading the Bible from a follower perspective. Because what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not your own lusts that drive you? You hear what I'm saying? Isn't that funny? Why is it that the New Testament oftentimes says, as new creatures filled with gentleness and love and patience and those things, forgive one another. One of my favorite verses. If anyone holds anything against you, just as the Lord forgave you, forgive them. Boy, I could solve a lot of conflict right there. But it's who you are as a World II person, an unforgiven person, and it's what you do. It's what you do. You find anybody else come in and you try to operate on a biblical perspective with respect for other people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and, and people are immersed in World II, they'll look at you like, you're crazy. That's not how things get done. You gotta operate like this in order to get things done. And too much of our church growth material, as well as our leadership material, has operated from these principles, which are just baptized business principles. We throw a few scriptures at them that are taken out of context and all of a sudden they become the way to do it in church. Please, let's not do that. Let's not cherry pick our scriptures. Let's let the context talk to us. Now, this will ultimately lead to destruction. So God's way in, in World 1 was to, to lead us to fulfillment this way, after the fall, if we continue down the path, will lead us to destruction. Here's the quickie. God saw this and said, I have to redeem my creation. So I'm going to bring the person of Jesus in here. And the person of Jesus, I'm going to let him be what some call, and what the Bible calls in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the, either the last or the second Adam. Why? Because he was born perfect. He was a perfect human being. Perfect human being. And as the last, as the last Adam, 
Jesus has already, we've already mentioned it, that He came to be the perfect follower. He said it in John 6, 38. I've come to do the will of Him who sent me. What was the, what was the problem with Adam and Eve? They did not do the will of Him who created them. Okay? Interesting that Jesus, now this thought just came to mind, Jesus didn't say the one who created me either, mm. but the one who sent me. Mm. I love it. So within this term, within these ideas, we have both the being and the purpose of Jesus Christ. And His ultimate desire was to obey God's will. It was to obey the Father's will. And as such, He gives Himself on the cross. <clears throat> Let me make this statement. This might be a little provocative. Why? Well, let me ask this. What kept Jesus on the cross? I'll just ask it rhetorically because we don't have time. You, I've been thinking about what he's praying and God got consuming this whole time. Not my will. But but thy will, will be done. See, a follower prays that prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. What kept Jesus on the cross? I know we have some great songs about He was on the cross and I was on His mind. I got news for you. <laughs> I don't think I was on his mind. I'll tell you who was on his mind. The Father was on his mind. And at one point he said, why have you forsaken me? But yet he comes back around and says, you haven't forsaken me. I'm committing my spirit into, you, into your hands. Here I am. He said, follower to the end. What kept Jesus on the cross was not his love for me. It was His love for the Father. Mm -hmm. And let's be grateful that He had such a great love for the Father to do the will of the Father that He followed through with the will of the Father to the very end mm -hmm. and became our sacrifice for sin. That's, that's, folks, that's, that's good stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and, and because the power of the Holy Spirit is shed abroad in our hearts to reveal this beautiful Son of God, His death, His burial, His resurrection for us who believe, He creates this, what we call the church. It is the ecclesia, the out called. The called out ones is what we say. The ecclesia. Have you ever thought about oh, called out from what? Called out from world two. Now let me give you my final thoughts. Leaders. You haven't heard much about leaders in this little opening session, have you? But leader and leaders are necessary as a role within leadership. But in the Scriptures, leader is not a state of being. That thought knocked me over when I realized that leader is a role. I'm not created to lead. I'm created to follow. Mm -hmm. And as God directs in His providence, He's going to raise you up with your gifts, your talents, your abilities, and His desires to put you in a position of leader. Mm -hmm. But that's all it ever is. Because everybody's a follower. Why, why is the, the ground level at the foot of the cross? Because everybody there is a follower. We've got to break out these hierarchies of these are the leaders and they do the work. 
The beautiful thing about understanding a follower idea within the church is that if everybody in the church who claims the name of Christ is a follower, then everybody has a role and a responsibility within the body of Christ. But the way we've developed is, we think everybody in the church, if you're not a leader and you don't have that position, then you don't have any responsibility. And that's why churches constantly are seeking for people to take on roles and responsibilities because we have not taught them their follower responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I found 62 follower responsibilities in the New Testament. How many of you have ever been to a follower conference? <laughs> <laughs> We're kind of in one right now because this is what happens when we have one. 95% of your church are followers. Why aren't we teaching them how to follow? Why aren't we teaching them what their roles and responsibilities are? It's because we have fallen prey to world to thinking in the fact that everything rises and falls on leadership, so what we need is leaders. Quit recruiting leaders. Invest in followers. And guess what? As they follow closer and closer to God, and follow, they'll see the need and they'll step up just like you did. Just like you did. So, let me just say this. As the church, we are called to live in World 2. But while we live there, to live like World One. And crossing that divide can become, that's the learning point for us. Okay? I'm sorry, I'm four minutes late. But I hope today has been helpful and provocative. And that you will think through some of these things. You can even review the, the tape if you want. But I am passionate. Can you tell I'm a little passionate about this? <laughs> it's because I have taught so many young ministers over the past 15, 17 years who have been introduced to this material. They, they've gone into their churches and they've tried to implement it. But World 2 is so strong that it's very discouraging for them. But they'll say to me after their, their courses, this has revolutionized, well, this thinking has revolutionized my thinking on what it means to do church. And I have to believe, would, would you agree with me if we could do away with our egocentric hierarchies, with all the preening, and with all the expectation, and everybody just saw himself or herself as a follower of Christ who just happened to have a role and responsibility, that things could get done around the church without so much conflict in the church. Is most of our conflict revolving around who are you to tell me what to do? And why should I do that in the first place? We, we've come up with all these power-centric, leader-centric ideas about why that is. I want to share with you some follower-centric ideas that may have more biblical power in them when you share it to the heart of fellow followers. And by the way, the beautiful thing about a follower idea is that you're not responsible for whether your group or your church succeeds. The group is responsible. The followers, because everybody here is a follower. You have the title of leader, but if, lead, if followers aren't participating in, in that process, what, what happens? Nothing. So. Here's your final illustration. Y'all okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. There's your basic hierarchical structure. Am I on frame? Mm -hmm. okay. 
pointing in that direction. So here's your basic hierarchical. Uh, I don't have a problem with how you organize or how you, how it looks, as long as your thinking doesn't isn't hierarchical. Okay, <laughs> this is not the king. Uh, but let's just say, for instance, this is uh, a, a, your typical Baptist church. And at the head of most of, the, of, of, of these things, you have the pastor, correct? And the pastor in this, there's, he's got some followers under him and some followers under him. Are you with me? Does this look right? Now, what happens to this organization if, if the pastor leaves? Well, everything rises and falls on leadership. So, behold, nothing up this sleeve. No wires. What happened? Yeah. Nothing. I thought everything ro ro rose and fell on leadership. <coughs> on the leader. Nothing happened. <laughs> I don't mean to belittle that. But, but let's do it again. Maybe that's an aberration. Here we go. No, well, same thing. And by the way, that's an illustration of how most churches <coughs> do their pastor searches. They get rid of this one and go and call somebody back until they get tired of him and then get rid of that one and <laughs> call somebody back. There's one common denominator in this thing, and that is what? The followers. Right? So let's just say that you have this illustration here and you have this person right here in the middle. Can you see the middle person? Everybody's a follower except that person right there. That person has decided, I don't care what the pastor tells me to do. I'm just not doing it. I'm not going to do that. Why aren't you going to do it? I don't have a good reason. I'm just not going to do it. I'm a free moral agent. I have a free will. I can act on my own. Yes, you can. So this is what I'm going to do. I am not going to participate in that. Oops. So you see, maybe, just maybe, it's not the leader that causes the conflict. It's not the leader who, who's, who's not leading good enough so that things aren't getting done. Which is the typical. If you're a good enough leader, your people will follow you. <laughs> Tell that to Jesus. Um, <laughs> I can't think of any more perfect leader, can you? Yeah. I, I count the number of disciples who followed him on the Via della Rosa. Hmm? Zero. So, it may be that followers don't know how or what their responsibilities are. And we just need to lovingly say, as a fellow follower, let me share with you how this how this acts. Why should you participate in this group? Get down to the philosophical level. And if you can win the philosophical argument, you can get the heart of the person on your team to move forward with you. It won't be done through coercion. I mean, I don't mean, I'm not going to wax political or anything, but uh, I think we've seen the natural results of humans when they are coerced into getting vaccines. You just dig in your heels when somebody, anybody coerces you or, or bribes you. And by the way, pastors are good at coercing people. You know how they do it? <laughs> God wants you. <laughs> Sorry, we're we can be good manipulators. Let's not be. Let's be genuine followers of Christ, loving one another, following after Him. So my desire for you is to leave this place. Hopefully, you're encouraged, challenged. See you next time. Can I pray for us? Lord, thank you for creating us as followers. Thank you that we have found by your grace fulfillment. 
through following you. Enable us by your Spirit to follow you more nearly and clearly. And I thank you for my brothers and sisters, my fellow followers, that uh, we can think on these things and just continue to love you and love our fellow followers whom you 